All right. I know that this is the Thanksgiving season, and I have had one lesson on Thanksgiving. I'm not going to do another one tonight. But after visiting with Mr. Winford yesterday, I began to think about something that might really and truly be good for all of us to think about. And that is the story of life, according to the Bible. And so I want us tonight to take our time and look at some verses of Scripture. I've, I've been reading a lot today and yesterday and, and the day before, after I came back from down there, and, and look at some of the things about life. First of all, let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 39. This will be verse number 4. And I want us to think about some of the things that we're going to look at tonight in the way of how life is for us. We are blessed people. We are people that should be very thankful for our present state of health, mind, and well-being. Even though some of us may have some health issues, we still have, we have somewhat the measure of health that we need to sustain life. So I want us to look at this, Psalms 39 and verse number 4. I want, to leave, I want to read 4, 5, and 6. These are three pretty good verses that, that look at life. Alan, I'm going to start with you tonight. Lord, make me know my end and the measure of my day, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and my age is nothing before thee. Barely ever man at his best state is altogether vanity. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. Okay. There's much to be said about this verse, these verses of Scripture that Alan just read to us. Lord, make me to know mine end. Now, I understand where David was at this time in his life. You know, there were things that David had questions about. He knew where he was. He knew what had happened. He knew the end result of, of all of what God had, had shown him and has shown us. But when you ask the question, Lord, make me to know mine end, you know, there's something that we need to think about in, in that asking of that question. For all of us, wouldn't we want our end to be somewhat less catastrophic, no pain, without a lot of suffering, without a lot of uh, headaches and, and problems that the end of life actually brings sometimes to people. You know, we definitely want to know mine end uh, and the measure of my days. You know, we all want to stay for as long as we can. We all want to do for as, as best we can with life. But Sometimes, you know, and especially in, in, in the ministry, I've been in places, and I, and I was yesterday, when you see life, and it really and truly is not life, when you see something that's so catastrophic and something so, so very bad that it's not life. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's more or less suffering and, and heartache and, and, and displeasure and all the things that goes along with, with things that are not, not positive but all negative. And so I thought, you know, what, what does the Bible really teach us about looking at life? In this aspect, he says, you, you make me to know money, and Lord. And then he says, how frail I am. None of us in this room really and truly understands the frailty of life. You know, I don't think any of us do. You know, we, we live daily on thinking that, you know, we plan for tomorrow. We plan for the next day, and we plan for the next day, and we plan for years down the road, don't we? How frail I am. And we're going to look at some verses of Scripture that kind of puts us into the understanding of the frailty of life and how it works. Now, this is not to be a negative lesson. It's to be a positive lesson. It's one that should show us the direction of how it is that we should look at life and how that we should appreciate and be thankful. This is the, this is the time for Thanksgiving, and every day is the time for Thanksgiving and how that we ought to be thankful. Now, those verses. When Alan read that, every man walketh in vain, surely they are disquieted in vain, and he heapeth up riches and knoweth not shall, who shall gather them. There's one thing that's for sure about life that all of us needs to understand. Most of us understand accumulation, treasure, material possession. We understand those things. We have, all of us have things that we really and truly appreciate. 
But from the standpoint of understanding real life, you know what's going to happen to all those things that we accumulate on this earth? We brought nothing into this world. And it's a certain thing. We'll carry nothing with us when we go. Now, that doesn't mean we're not supposed to work hard and achieve and, and, and success in every aspect of materialism and all the things that goes along with it. That's all great and wonderful. But when it comes right down to it, here's a part of life. Don't matter how much we got, don't matter what it means to us, don't matter how much it's worth, it's not going to be ours forever. It's just going to be a short period of time. And when I say a short period of time, look at these kids. The other day, Sarah and Trey both was little kids. They're grown people now. And that was yesterday. They were little kids. And I'm serious. That's the way it works. You know, there's a little Camden, same way, you know. So let's look at life from the standpoint of a positive view. Now, in the book of Psalms, chapter 90, go all the way over to 90 and verse number 10. We're looking at some, some uh, numbers here. Psalms 90, in verse number 10. Michelle, you're back in the corner. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they by four, four score years, yet it their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Consideration. Vicky's mother lived 101 years and 14 days, you know, which was a blessing from God to have a life that spanned that period of time. Not many people. Percentage-wise, I think it was less than 1% or something like that that reached that age, you know, in America. Uh, and, and, and that's wonderful. But you see, if she could talk to us today, she'd say how quick those 101 years and 14 days went by. You know, for most of us, you know, and I, I looked at a little picture the other day. I, I did have it in my Bible. Me and Alan was standing out front and with uh, Grandpa Murphy, and we were talking to him, and he, and he was standing there. And Alan was a little young guy, a little young boy, and that was yesterday, it seemed like. You know, and that's, that's kind of the way you look at things. I mean, we look at things and don't count on count on what we're talking about. You know how much three score and ten is? Anybody know? Seventy. Seventy. Now don't look that way, Bobby. You ain't far. You ain't far away. You know, Bobby's looking at me like <laughs> he knows I'm there. <laughs> but he ain't far away. But consider the thought. Three score and ten. Mr. Wallace could run ten miles when he was seventy. He probably can still do that now. I don't know. But, you know, 70 years old is not old, y'all. It's not old. And he says three score and ten. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to reach 70 and pass away. It doesn't mean that. This is just something to give us a view of, of how we view life. Three score and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years. You know, four score, 80. Reason of strength. Look at the strength of these. And, and you know, that's, that's a blessing within itself. He said, yet is there strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we all fly away, or we fly away. It's, it's an appointment, you know. And after visiting with Brother Winford yesterday, you know, it, it's sad that you reach a point in life when life is no more a life to live, quality. You know, it's, it's hard to think about that. And this is not a, a negative view. It, it's, a, it's a positive view. Let's look at Proverbs 27, verse 1. Yes, sir? Uh, not only for us to think about th that particular passage in the years, but think of the people then. They're not as far removed as we are from those that live hundreds of years. So they're, you know, they're now living... 80, 70, and 80 years. People not too far removed from them were living 400, 500, 600 years. That's right. Hey, I've only got 80 versus what, you know, so-and-so had at 400 or whatever. That, that had to have been a, you know. If you think about Methuselah, you know, 969 years old.
But you know, somebody asked, somebody asked me one time, and I have, I've asked other people to, to make sure I told it right, but they said, you know, they, they couldn't have ever counted years and months and weeks and days like we counted. But apparently from every indication and what the Scripture teaches, they did account for that because they talked about summer and winter and fall and spring. They talked about the, the, the ages of time and all that. So undoubtedly, I personally believe, and a lot of other people do, that they did account for the years like we do, you know, years and months, you know. And so it's, it's very obvious that, as you say, Bobby, you know, when you look back at people that was living, a lot of, a lot of the older, uh, in the Old Testament, a lot of those lived several hundred years, you know. Uh, and that was, that was amazing. Now if, if somebody lives 100 years, they're in that 1% category, you know, in, in our nation, you know. So let's look at something else here. <clears throat> in Proverbs 27, verse 1, we, we find a little bit of, of noise to make here about something that I think sometimes we, we don't really treat exactly right. Sandy, you want to read that for me? Okay, I got my glasses. Oh, yeah. Okay, Bertie, you want to read it? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Okay. How many of us actually make plans for tomorrow? Now, tonight, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. There's all kind of plans being made, all kind of people traveling, all kind of things going on, and, and, and we're hoping and praying, and we're, we're looking at this thing from the standpoint, what, what are we going to do tomorrow? We're going to eat everything we can find. You know, that's what we're going to do. But when you think about life, he says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. He doesn't mean not to plan for it in case it does come, but to recognize how, how we should understand that tomorrow may not come. You know, I've done some funerals. Uh, well, you know, I've had four in the last three weeks, but it looks like, you know, to me, you know, a lot of times people, I've had funerals before when, I talked to the people that morning. Everything was great and wonderful. And then that that evening, or sometime during that day, I got a call and said, "You know, so and so passed away. They had a heart attack, or they got killed in a car wreck, or something happened." You know, it just gives us a little bit of the. It's not being insensitive. It's to to allow us to understand that life is it, frail. It's a frailty of life. You know, it's. You know, it's, it can be very obvious that things can happen and we may not see tomorrow, but we hope we do. Any thoughts or comments? This is open for, this is Bible study. You know, I've thought about it from the standpoint, you know, in, in times past whenever we had corporal, uh, capital punishment. If you were sentenced to death and then your death date was set that you were going to be executed, can you imagine what the anxiety level would be as though as that day drew nearer and nearer and nearer. Isn't it wonderful that God doesn't, he doesn't put it in such a way that we have to know the exact time, place, and moment in time whenever we're going to leave this old world. He doesn't do it. He, he hasn't done it that way. And so he does keep us in perspective because he says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you don't know what a day may bring forth. So it's an uncertainty when it comes to that. Now, nobody wants to die, but from the standpoint that what we're looking at here, life is, it's kind of one of those things that's it's temporary here on earth. And so Ecclesiastes 6 <clears throat> and verse number 12. I, I think about how it's defined and described sometimes here. So we're coming back over here, Diane. You want to get that? My big letters on my phone. All these folks with no glasses and big letters. Steve, you can read that. I know you got your glasses on. Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 12. For well, who knows what is good for man in life? All the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? Okay. There's a lot of info here in this little verse that he just read to us. He says, who, who knows what is good for a man in his life? All the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. 
What does that seem, seem like? As he, spend, as he spendeth like a shadow, what does that sort of put us in mind of? You know, we see a shadow when the sun's up, don't we? And then if a cloud comes up, the shadow goes away. In the end of the day, the shadow goes away. And it, it doesn't take long. The time for the shadow is brief, you know. And, and that's kind of the way, that's kind of the way life is. So what, what do we do with knowing these things? We live our life as best we can. For God, we live our life hoping and praying that heaven will be our home. We live our life because we don't know when that time's going to come. And so, you know, we continue on to look at some of the, the very basic things about life. Uh, let's see, I, I wanna, I'm going to back up and go to Matthew right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go forward for just a minute here. I want to go to Matthew chapter 19. And this is verses 16. And this is going to be, this is going to be pretty good reading. This is 16 down through uh, verse number uh, 20. Uh, Pam Johnson, I'm going to get you to read that. This is 16 all the way up to verse 20. Okay. Now, this is a this is pretty pretty detailed for us. Good master, what can I do to inherit eternal life? You know, there's two kind of life. You know, we live in our physical life now. We all are. We're living our physical life. It may be long, it may be short, but we're living our physical life on earth. This is a temporary life. There's an appointment we'll all keep. It's called death. But there's going to be an eternal life. There's a two kind of life. There's going to be an eternal life. It's going to be a life that's going to last for throughout eternity. When we think about eternal life versus where we're at now, we're talking about three score and ten, maybe a hundred, possibly, you know, looking back at some of those that lived a long life of three or four hundred years, or even five hundred or nine hundred, according to the Bible with Methuselah. But that's, that's nothing compared to eternity. Eternity is forever and ever and ever. And it's hard, it's hard for us to grasp that. This man here is asking a question to, in, in the parable. He says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? He understood, I'm sure, that the physical life he was living is going to stop. But Jesus begins to talk and tell him, you know, things that you need to do to inherit eternal life. Now, we need to focus on some of these things that he's talking about. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters, fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. So there's a host of things that he gives us information about that can help us in this life to obtain the life that we're all striving for. So everybody here tonight, if I asked the question, how many of you want to go to heaven? Everybody in this room would raise their hand. You want to go to heaven. Heaven is where eternal life is at. This life in which we're living now, we look at some of the things that teaches us about life. Let's go to James 4. James chapter 4, verse number 14. James chapter 4, verse number 14. Miss Judy, I'm going to come back up to the front and get you on this one. James 4, verse number 14. James 4, verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is into the vapor that appears for a little time, and then vanishes away. Have you ever noticed how this works? I mean, he says, what is your life? And he says, it's a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. 
How many of us actually in, in times past, we've seen a morning fog, and we've seen a little bit of, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, it, it just kind of blurs our view, you know. And then the sun comes up in a little while, and then that fog and dissipates, and that view is cleared up. But that fog is light, you know, the, the, the very brevity of light, you know. I've thought about it a lot of times, you know, when uh, Grandpa used to, to preach and, and he'd talk about this verse of Scripture, and, and sometimes when I'd see the fog, I'd think, how long is it going to last? And sometimes it lasts a couple of hours, sometimes it lasts a little more, and sometimes it wouldn't last but just a few minutes, you know. And I think that's real life. That's what it's all about, you know. Some people live a full life, what we consider a full life, and some people don't, you know. I've preached infants' funerals before, you know, little tiny babies. They didn't live a full life. Their fog was brief, you know. And, you know, then there's been young people that live just a few years in their teenage years and some in their early 20s. And how many soldiers have we had in the course of the Vietnam conflict, and you know, a lot of you know I'm a student of history, and you know, when you think about 518,000 under the age of 30 in World War II that gave their life in one battle, in one battle, the Battle of Normandy. You think about that, you know. I mean, that's, that's an unbelievable, just before the age of 30, you know. And you know, life goes by, and it goes by so fast. But we're looking at something that's, that's really eye-opening when it comes to life. And I thought about this yesterday as I, as I visited with Mr. Winford. You know, life is something precious to us all, and we want as much as we can to have good life, you know. But sometimes it may come to a point where we get in a situation, you know, just like him, when he, there's not much of a way he can get better, you know, and it's bad. Let's look at Matthew 25, 46. Matthew 25, verse 46. This gives a little insight. Now, this one here, Gary Bragg, I need you on this one. Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away as the everlasting punishment, but the righteous into the life everlasting. Okay. We have something here of clarity. He said, if you want this life that lasts forever, this eternal life that we're talking about, he puts a word there. And that word has a very, very big bearing on eternal life. That's that life that goes on forever, not the life in which we live here, the physical life in which we're in now. That's the life in the hereafter. But he says the word righteous, the word righteous. And he puts righteous with eternal life. He said the righteous into eternal life. So I don't know how y'all look at that, but, you know, if really and truly we wanted to live forever, and that's most of us would say now, you know, I, I know I talk to people all the time. They're afraid, and I'll be afraid too. I've been there when they, I heard, you know, he won't be here tomorrow. But I was afraid, you know. I hear people all the time, I'm not afraid to die. You know, there's something there that uh, I've not seen that. I've heard people say it, but when it came right down to it, that old heart was beating a lot faster than what it normally would. That sweat was on the brow, and, and they were doing, they were holding on for dear life, you know. And they were holding on to life, you know. Now you hear all these people say, oh, I'm not afraid. Think about it for a moment. Now look at this verse. He said the righteous in etern into eternal life. So, the word righteous for us, that's our ticket. That's how we get to the place where we never have to worry again. We never have to think about life ever again. It's eternal in the heavens. And the word righteous means right. And how do we learn what's right? I mean, where, where is right? I mean, what's right and what's wrong? How do we learn that? It's right here in this book. This is God's book. This is God's plan. This is the script in which we need to use to find our self righteous. You know, he tells us what to do and how to do. Any thoughts or comments? Yeah, I think this is the first time I've read this.
read it in this manner, but when it says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, and then the righteous into eternal life. So, if you go to heaven, it is a life. If you go into the other place, it's not a life. It's not even, you know, it's not, you can't compare it and say, well, I've got, I've got a life in hell, I've got a life in hell. No, you got a life if you're in heaven. But it's not life if you go into hell. This is not apples to apples and oranges to oranges. No. When you see that word punishment and you and then you look at the word eternal life, you know, there's a lot of difference there in how this works. And, you know, for the most part, I find people today who take life so much for granted. You know, they live just like they're going to live forever here on earth. They just don't care. I mean, y'all y'all think about where we're at, and I'm not getting into the political aspect of this for any reason, but y'all think about where we're at. We have so much stupidity in our society today when it comes down to what the Bible teaches, it's unimaginable. I mean, the, num the numbers have increased dramatically with stupidity when it comes down to what the Bible teaches about life. They don't care about what's after this life. They don't even know what's after this life. They're stu the the stupidity has reached a level unprecedented. But now we're looking at things that really does magnify life. Let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I'm going to be looking at 24, 25, and 29. 24, 25, 29. Jessica, you way down there on the end. Yeah, I know you can read. Verily, verily, verily I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but it passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now it is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. 29. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Okay. Now, here's, here's, before we get to verse 39, here's something I want us to think about for just a moment. As we look into the, to this, these verses that Jessica just read to us there, he said, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear it shall live. We can look at life on earth, and we can understand it from what the Bible teaches. But this is not the end. This is not the end. And so when somebody passes from this life, that's not the end. That's but the beginning, you know. And a lot of times people, they don't see it that way. They don't understand it. You know, they, they just kind of count when somebody passes away and, and death comes and, and they're gone from this life, they just kind of write them off and that's it. But that's just the beginning. You know, they will live again. And, you know, that life again will be an eternal part, the eternal part. And so, you know, the Bible's very plain. And somebody says, well, I don't, I don't know that I see it that way. I mean, look at, look at the graveyard. Some of these graves have been out there for thousands of years. So what? One of these days, those that have been there for thousands of years will live again, you know in another life. And the eternal life is where we're concentrating and we're thinking about. The latter part of that in verse number 39 of that same chapter, Linda, 39 of John 5. Search, <clears throat> search the scriptures for it. In them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. Okay. Search the scriptures. What do we need to know about life? That's what we're doing tonight. We're searching the scriptures. We're finding out about life. We're looking at the physical life. We're looking at the earthly life. And we're looking at the spiritual aspect, the eternal part of life. I think about how people view life today. And some people live life, oh, man, I would hate to live their life the way they live their life. Uh, this... 
this part of uh, in Romans chapter 2 verse number 7 I want to look at that one Gary Anderson we're going to look at you on this one Romans 2 verse number 7 to those who by persistence <coughs> in doing good seek glory honor and immortality he will give eternal life okay to them who by patient continuance and well doing now you know, the word seek in the King James Version for glory and honor and immortality, even in Gary's the translation he's using. We seek, that means we look for it. Now, I ain't too anxious to get out of this life. I got still got a few plans that I'd like to carry through on. But just so happens that we need to be that person seeking that if that time comes, that's what we're for. That's what we're after. Now, if we're seeking something, that means we're looking forward to it, we're moving in that direction, and we're hoping to get to that point. So when you think about what we just read here, it's very important for us to understand. He said, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Those three things, glory, honor, and immortality. That's, that's an unimaginable thing consideration there but he says patient continuance and well-doing that means don't quit don't give up you know we can't do that I mean I wonder how many times in our life we've actually thought about throwing in the towel you know it's, there's no reason to go on this let's, let's just quit you know it's just like church you know when it when it comes time to be in the services you know how important is that to us is that part of seeking an eternal life yes that's part of putting the measure of seek to a level that we, we can understand. The Lord expects us to be in church and to worship. He expects us to attend the assembly. And that's part of seeking for the eternal life. That's part of looking for that life after this life. He says patient continuance and well-doing. You know, we may not always get rewarded for what we do if it's good. But I tell you what, God knows it's good, and the reward will come eventually, without a doubt. You ever done anything you thought you was going to get paid for and you didn't get paid for? If you've ever done that before, that's kind of a disappointment, isn't it? Well, this is the way life is. You, you continue on with well-doing in this life, you get paid for it eventually. It won't be that God will give up on you and not, and not pay you. The reward will be there. Any thoughts or comments? All right, let's look at another one then. Uh, I want us to look at, uh, in 1 Timothy, verse number 4, and verse number 8, 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse number 8. Tina. You want to read that for me? For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Okay. Compares bodily exercise. Now, everybody needs to exercise your body. Keep your body moving in the right direction. Keep things uh, open and, and, and shut, you know, as far as being able to move about and all that stuff. But what's going to happen to this body? It's going to deteriorate. It's going to go back to the dust of the earth from whence it came. According to the scripture, that's what happens. But in essence of what we're looking at here, he said godliness is the profitable thing. He said it's profitable unto all things. Now, why is it? He says because it has the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So living a Christian life is a good way to live your life. You know, you stay pretty much out of trouble when you live as a Christian. You know, you're not really and truly uh, always looking over your shoulder because you're trying your best to do what's right in the sight of God, you know. And there are a lot of people out there, they're always kind of, if they're living a life like some people live, they're always having to look over their shoulder, hoping and praying that somebody ain't looking for them or, or the police ain't coming to get them, or something's not going wrong, 
You know, but if we live a Christian life, if we live a good life, we don't have to worry about that. He said godliness is profitable even in this life. And not only is it profitable in this life, but it's profitable in the life hereafter. So living a good, decent Christian life is worth it in this life and in the life hereafter. All right. Uh, in 1 Timothy, we'll stay there for just a minute. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse number 12. 1 Timothy 6, in verse number 12. Trey, are you looking with us tonight? How about reading that for me, Trey? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Word to thou art also called and has professed a good profession for many witnesses. Okay. Thank you for reading that. I'm thankful to have Trey in our, in our group. But here's, here's a look at this for just a minute. Fight the good fight of faith, he reads. Now, now look at that. Fight the good fight of faith. <laughs> is it hard sometimes to keep everything moving in the right direction? It is, isn't it? And if we're going to obtain faith, it's worth fighting for. And to fight the fight of faith means that we're going to struggle we're going to struggle to keep things moving in the right direction. And sometimes, you know, it's going to be hard, but we're going to make it in the end. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, what does it have to do with what we're talking about tonight? He said, lay hold on eternal life. That's what we're talking about is life, both physical and spiritual, both temporary and eternal. Now, if we fight the fight of faith and we keep our faith, where it needs to be, he said, you lay hold on eternal life. You obtain that eternal life. And the only way I know we're going to do that is if we stay the course. We can't throw in the towel. We can't ever quit. You know, somebody asked me today, they said, what do you think this country's going to look like in the next 10 years? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, what do you think about, what, what are you going to do for the next 10 years? I said, I'm going to try to keep doing what I've done for the last 25 or 30 years. I'm going to try to live for God as best I can. I'm going to try to do what's right in the sight of God. I'm going to try to live a peaceable life. And that's what I'm hoping if I live 10 more years. I'm hoping for that. But if I don't, I still want to live for as long a period of time as I can and do what we're talking about. Lay hold on eternal life. The only way you're going to do that is to live a faithful life. A faithful Christian life. You can't quit. And, you know, there's a lot of people that's going to be caught unprepared. And that, that's, that's what we're talking about, eternal life. A good profession of faith before many witnesses. Okay, let's look at another one right here real quick. Uh, I've heard people say, let's go to Acts 17.25. Acts 17.25. Acts 17, 25. Let's send back to my left side. Kimbo. Acts 17, 25, Kim. Neither is worship with men's hands or sensible men's hands, though he needed anything from men's hands. Seeing he giveth to all, all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the, and the bounds of their habitation. Okay. This is something we all need to think about from the standpoint of how, how our world and our society has got. Who made man? God did. He made a red man, a black man, a white man, a yellow man. He made us all. And God is the God of all mankind. Don't matter where we're at, what we are. If we're human being and we're mankind, God made us. He put us together. He made us. He giveth to all life and breath and all things. Now, he hath made of us all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That means God has set the rule. God's in control. God's in charge. And a lot of times people, you know, they, they forget that. God's still in control of life and death. He always will be. 
Somebody said, now you wait a minute. There's a lot of people that commit suicide. Yes, they do. But God's still in control of that eternal life, the temporary life in which we live here. You know, that aspect of it, we have some control on the temporary life in that aspect. We may take our life. Something may happen and somebody else may take our life. But God still holds the life that matters the most in his hand, and that's the eternal part. Now, verse number 28 is a very important verse of Acts 17, and it, it carries a lot of weight with this. So let's, let's go, uh, let's see, who hasn't read on this side? Uh, Diane don't have her glasses. And, all right, uh, Pam, love, can you read verse 28? For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own voice have said, for we are also his offspring. Okay. The godly aspect of us is that God made us, breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, imparted a living soul. The godly aspect of every single one of us is that everybody in this room has a soul. That came from God. That put us in control of one thing. For in him we live and move and have our very being. We're in control of how we deal with this, but God, he put instilled life, even this life in which we live now. That's why it's so hard for me, and I get in trouble when I say this. It's so hard for me to understand a human being that could, that could agree on something like taking a baby's life through that aspect of abortion. Now, God's in control of that baby's life on the eternal side. But look at man. If you don't think there's going to be some people that spend eternity in hell, you think about what Jesus said. He took a little child, held it in his hands, and he said, except you become as this little child, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what kind of an individual could do something like that? Now, you think about where we're at with the Bible. You know, it's not medical. It's not medical. It's murder. And, you know, people say, well, you can't go there. Yeah, you can. If you look at what God said, you can. Eternal is, belongs to God. Temporary, this life in which we live here, it's still, for in him we live. Without God, we couldn't have this life. We move, and we have our very being. He even controls this life. He gives life. All right, let's go on a little further. <clears throat> James 4, verse 15 is a very, very powerful verse of Scripture. Marilyn, have we got to you yet? No, no okay, sir. Okay, let's get there. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. Okay. We put it all on God in this verse of Scripture. We ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, do this or that. It's God's will if we make another day. It's God's will. You know, how many times do we pray, if it be your will, God? We always are supposed to pray, if it be God's will. We'll do this or that. It's so important. I'm going to look at just a couple more, then our time is, is used up for the night. Uh, <clears throat> in John chapter 5, John chapter 5. This will be verse number 24. Betty, have we got to you yet? No. Let's get John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Okay. Hearing the words, Pretty good, pretty good thing. He that heareth the word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. You hear the word, believe. Now, if we believe, what are we going to do? We're going to do what he says. If we really believe it, we're going to do what he says. And what does he say? He says, you hear it, you believe it, 
You repent, you confess, you be baptized, the Lord will add you to the Lord's church. If we believe that, you know, and we live a Christian life, that's where life is. That's the matter of fact about life. Now, let's look at... Uh, uh, John 10, verse 10. I want to get that one out of the way. John 10, verse 10. Let's see here. Elaine, looks like it's going to be your time. Well, I haven't got to hear from you yet. John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Somebody's always asked the question, what is the abundant life? Okay, why did Jesus come into the world and die on the cross for the abundant life? It wasn't for the physical life that we live on earth that he died for. He gave that life up when he died that day on the cross. But he gave us the ability to have the abundant life. That means a, a more plush, a better, a further along, an eternal life. And that abundant life is the eternal life. That's what Jesus did when he brought when he died that day on the cross, he brought the abundant life. We could have life more abundantly. That means we, we had something added to life. We had eternity added to life through the cross. Any thoughts or comments? Okay. Let's just finish up then with John chapter 11, verse number 26. Uh, Y'all, who hadn't read? Somebody raise their hand. Uh, Bruce hadn't read. Bruce, I don't know why I hadn't called on you. I think it's because you was ugly to me tonight when we started out. Okay, you go ahead. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? All right, think about that for just a moment. We are all concerned about death. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Well, we know what that really and truly carries. You know, people will take that out of context and they'll say, hey, man, you just believe in God and you're going to live eternally. Jesus says, if you love me, if you believe me, what are you going to do? Keep my commandments. What's his commandments? To hear, to believe, repent, confess, be baptized, wash away your sins. That's what his commandment is. So if you believe in the Lord, you do what he says, you know, and we just read some verses back there, you know. If we do this, if we do that, if we do this, we will inherit eternal life. So those verses that we looked at tonight, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read this one real quick for you. I'm going to Romans 6, 4. Listen to what he said. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. We are buried with him by baptism into his death, that like his Christ was raised up then from the dead, he says, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. You'll get that part now. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So there we have it. There's so much more about life we could, go, we could continue on, but our time is up for tonight. Any thoughts, comments, or questions about what we studied tonight? I know it's Thanksgiving, but man, aren't, aren't we thankful for life? And uh, we want to be thankful for life, and we all want to go to heaven when this life is over. And so we've looked at some very important verses of Scripture tonight that teach us a little bit more about the clarity and the brevity of life. All right.